Josh's story, then. Throughout the video, photos are shown of Josh, his mother, and several family members of his birth family, and other friends and people in his support system. My life, my story, my journey. I was a normal child. I lived with my mother. She meant the world to me. We would laugh, sing, and play games. This was before all hell broke loose. My mother gave me away when I was six. She felt she needed to get her life together and that I was holding her back from doing so. Every night I was gone. I longed for her smell, her touch, and her kiss. Instead, most nights I suffered physical, emotional, mental, and sexual abuse. Counselors and supportive adults helped me get out of these situations. Angels sent by God to set me free. Through my downfalls, all I ever wanted was the simple mother's touch I missed so much. So I acted out to get it. And that caused me to move in and out of 11 different homes and attend 9 different schools. All through this treacherous journey, I was told I wouldn't be anything. That I would be a statistic. I remember thinking to myself, what would you do if your mother died? Sure enough, when I was 11, my mother died. At that time, I realized I had to make a choice. I listened to my aunt. She said, a child is not responsible for where they're born or who they're born to. So I looked at myself. I said, this is my life and I refuse to let it trail to dust. I began to build a network of support. School was my escape and it opened doors and sparked opportunities. Many people never look past the mask I wear. They say, your parents must be so proud of you, failing to realize that I have no parent. Last year, I graduated from high school, and this year I finished my first year in college. Three years from now, I plan to be starting a master's degree program in social work administration. My goal is to improve the foster care system so that it values young people's strengths, talents, and voices, proving that we're so much more than statistics. We lift our voices high and say, you can't beat a foster child because we are ride or die soldiers on the rise. Simply, it shouldn't be a surprise. Created by Joshua Griggs. Special thanks to Portland Community Media, Pete and Tim, Joan Morse, and Amy Hill. This story was created in a digital storytelling workshop sponsored by the National Resource Center for Family-Centered Practice and Permanency Planning at the Hunter School of Social Work and funded by the Children's Bureau Discretionary Grants Program, Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, award number 90CW1131-01. Produced September 2007 by the Center for Digital Storytelling, www.storycenter.org. Listen deeply, tell stories. Logo for the Center for Digital Storytelling. Josh's Story, Now. Who will cry for the little boy? I will. I always do. There I was, 18 years old, enthusiastic about my life possibilities. I knew that I wouldn't be a statistic. I graduated high school, earned my bachelor's degree and master's degree, and went on to pay it forward to other young adults with similar backgrounds as mine, pouring into their lives the motivation, encouragement, and support provided to me. Then I met age 28, and the darkness poured down on me. All the while, I knew who my birth family was and had reconciled my relationship with my father. I began to experience many losses my aunt, who took the role of my mother, was murdered. My support network began to disappear. I felt like I was suffocating, gasping for air. I lost my sense of self, self-efficacy, and self-confidence. Foster care taught me how to survive. But what do you do when your survival mechanisms go bankrupt? negative thoughts 
took over my mind. You are unlovable, unwanted, dumb, and will never measure up. I began to believe these thoughts. I questioned myself and ability to be successful. I lost motivation for life and felt like giving up. What sustained me was the passion and commitment to foster kids in my community. Being in this pain and authentically unmasking my needs, wants, and desires, I ask that we do the following. Invest more resources in building authentic relationships and rapport with foster kids and their families of origin to support their growth and transformation. We need to interrupt racism and cultivate a positive racial identity for youth of color. We need to provide trauma-specific interventions that develop resiliency. We need to focus attention on those kids in the system who appear successful, as they need us too. We need to engage and implement community voice and system change efforts, as that's where the real expertise exists. Alumni need resources and support that practically teach ongoing life skills. And finally, we need to ensure that the child welfare workforce can provide gifts of the hands, head, and heart, not just the head. Acknowledgements. Antoine Fisher for the quote, Who Will Cry for the Little Boy? Auntie Brenda Gale Williams, Rest in Love, for Unyielding Love and Support. Sharissa Hudson, for Photos, Love, and Support. Father Isam Morgan, for My Life, Teaching Me How to Ride a Bike, and Your Support and Encouragement. I love you. All the advocates out there making a difference for foster kids, families, and communities. Special thanks to the Oregon Post Adoption Resource Center and Kendra Morris Jacobson. Thank you to the Center for States and Olga, Noah, and Joan. These stories were created in a digital storytelling workshop held at Oregon Post Adoption Resource Center. We would like to thank the staff for their support. This product was created by the Capacity Building Center for States under contract number HHSP 2332-0150-0071-I, funded by the Children's Bureau, Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Logos for the Children's Bureau and the Capacity Building Center for States.